kneel before Zor. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war Hang on! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Going Ape, with an exclamation mark, released April 10th, 1981. It was written and directed by Jeremy Joe Kronzberg and released by Paramount Pictures. The working title was Love Max, a reference to a running gag where... Danny DeVito recites dumb proverbs and then punctuates them all by shouting, Love Maxa, that I might not even mention in our recap because it's irrelevant and not funny. I don't actually, I mean, like, is it supposed to be, like, the end of a letter? I think they're just things that Max used to say, and he's delivering them on Max's behalf. Okay. It just, it never really made sense to me because it was, to me, it was like he was quoting, you know, some, some, something written because like the 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 movie takes place like after his death spoiler right. alert so there's a will so you in theory he could have been signed by him so like love max but it's just i like, think he's just it he's doesn't just, make sense after every after every sentence he's, he's he's signing every uh message he delivers from max i thought for sure max was still alive for the whole story yeah, yeah that's that was a possibility for sure After the success of his script for Every Which Way But Loose and not being invited back to write Any Which Way You Can, writer-director Jeremy Joe Kronzberg wrote his own ape movie to star Manus, the ape who initially played Clyde in Every Which Way But Loose, and two other orangutans from the same trainer, Bobby Barasini's stable. The film has never been available on DVD or Blu-ray, but the Tony Danza fan club of Los Angeles is actively campaigning for a Blu-ray release. The uh, the version we watched wasn't bad. No, it's not. The, I was it's, surprised at the quality, actually. Uh, what was that? Uh, YouTube? The I th- YouTube? I think we rented yeah. it on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I rented it on Amazon, and it was still better than the quality that Amy was. Oh, okay. Um, that might be a good candidate for our eventual Blu-ray publishing division, Vintage Video Publishing. We open panning across grass as a man digs a grave and slowly tilt up on a funeral. An elephant is heard trumpeting, and a child mourner turns around with a big smile on his face and walks away from the funeral he was attending to gawk at another nearby funeral. Well, he's not the only one. Right. Everybody turns and leaves to follow the kid. Horses tow big circus carriages with pipe organs through the cemetery, and showgirls ride elephants in circles around headstones. An entire carnival has been installed over these hollowed grounds. On a marching band's drum, we can read that this is the Sabatini Circus, And a mausoleum in the far background features the name Kronzberg etched in stone, a clear reference to writer-director Jeremy Joe Kronzberg, who is also the father of that kid that walked away from the other general. Mm -hmm. And that kid is in other things. Yep. The ringmaster calls the crowd's attention to the center circle of the festivities to eulogize Max Sabatini, the dearly departed founder of their circus family. He withdraws from Max's coffin a message from the man himself. Today, it is my last wish that you all remember me, Max Sabatini, as I lived and not as I died. Damn. To punctuate this line, we hard cut to a framed black and white photograph of a man walking a tightrope, but the picture falls from the wire used to mount it to the wall, implying that Max's death may have been involved in some sort of a tightrope walk gone wrong. We see a pair of disembodied hands collect the picture and stuff it on a shelf, and then they set to work carving a small splinter of wood off the desk and tuck the scrap into a folded sheet of lamination paper, and then place that in a heated press. The camera tilts up on a bulletin board littered with flyers about where to send your $10 if you'd like to own a splinter from the Holy Cross of the Bible or the bat that Babe Ruth used to win the 1932 World Series. Do you recall the last movie where someone tried to sell splinters of Jesus's cross? Mm. Oh, shoot. Um, it wasn't Fear No Evil, was it? No. No. Um, <sighs> Jason Robards was the person who had the cross. Oh, right. It was Cabo Blanca. Yeah. 
Now we see the rest of the man that the hands belong to. This is Foster Sabatini, as played by Tony Danza. He's late for something, possibly his father's funeral, though at this point I assumed it was the will reading because I thought he'd already missed the funeral. He holds up two suits side by side to make a decision. At the still ongoing funeral, the ringmaster balls up another page of Sabatini's final words and drops it with about 12 more balled up pages in the grass. The ringmaster draws the attention of the crowd to Sabatini's faithful assistant, Laszlo, played by Danny DeVito, as he performs a symbolic final walk across the tightrope over Max's coffin. Foster arrives late to the ceremony and gets a lot of nasty looks. The ringmaster pulls out an extra sheet of paper, seemingly prepared for this exact occasion. When a mother calls a son a bastard, you can take her word for it. The executor of Max Will hands Foster a letter from his dad in accordance with his instructions. Now, as a young man sit at the grave. Father. For this moment, Foster is standing beside two Asian American strongman characters. Neither is credited in the film or IMDb, but I am 110% certain that one of them is Al Leong, a.k.a. Bob Genghis Khan from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, hmm. and the Wing Kong Hatchet Man in Big Trouble in Little China. The letter tells him that of the two jackets that he held up before leaving the house, he chose the wrong one. The eulogy wraps up. Always remember, God give one a leather bottle full of gold. The devil gives a golden bottle full of shit. Right above the casket, Laszlo loses his balance and lands in an enormous pile of flowers atop the coffin. We cut to the reading of the will. The executor tells the story of the family. Max had a lot of daughters and one son, who abandoned the circus a long time ago. Turns out, in an effort to lure Foster back into circus life, he's leaving him his three most prized possessions. The sisters are obviously furious until they hear the prize. I leave my three babies. Rusty, Tiga, and Poppy. <laughs> Somehow the will also dictates that Foster will somehow take possession of Laszlo the assistant. Like yes. He's a human inheritance. Foster stands to leave and trips over a row of empty chairs, but the executor continues. If he can keep the apes alive for two years, he will be granted Max's entire $5 million estate. And the sisters are so sure that this won't happen that they're still happy about it yeah but i feel like it would have made more sense for them to be at least worried if not angry about this well, well but it's not going to go to them anyways it's not going to go to them whether he succeeds or not that's true so i don't know why they would i mean i guess they're just thrilled at his misery yeah but they would also be angry that one of them has a shot at five million dollars and it's none of them yeah but also we'll never see these characters ever again correct because we're going to introduce other characters who want the money right for other reasons lots like, of other characters why, why why not just have the sisters be the antagonists yeah i could tell you why they wouldn't do that because our antagonists at, at, at certain points are attempting to murder these apes and i feel like these apes being sort of of the family at least mm. of the circus anybody from within the circus even though they feel jilted should not murder the apes well, <laughs> yeah but isn't leaving the apes in tony Danza's custody kind of murdering them it's a, it is like almost like a death sentence because they don't care <laughs> about the apes they're they're clearly hoping for him to kill at least one of them i don't know if they're hoping for him to kill one well of they don't them. want him to get the money i don't think he, they, but like i said it's not going to go to them right but they don't want it to go to him either and also they're they're relieved that he's getting the apes and that they don't have to take care of them yeah yeah it's also weird that the two-year deadline mentioned in the letter is supposed to correspond with the two years that Max has spent taking care of them, which implies that when he composed this will, he knew exactly when he would die. Mm. Also, so did Max commit suicide to dump his apes on Foster here? <laughs> also, is the movie taking place over the course of two years? I don't think no. so, but the, the implication is made that time is running out yeah, exactly. very quickly. He opens the door to leave and finds Laszlo and the apes and faints. We spin transition to Foster at home with his girlfriend Cynthia explaining why he left the circus while she packages his phony splinters for shipment. No, they're real splinters. Right, but they're not the kinds of splinters they're supposed to be. Right? Maybe they are. I don't know. Maybe that desk the was desk made of the crucifix. made for the cross. <laughs> it's repurposed. His father used to take him on the tightrope and prank dropped him into the net without mentioning it was there. Apparently this was a family tradition. He warns Cynthia not to mix up the cross splinters with the bat splinters. She asks what he's going to do about the apes, and he takes his time admitting that he's going to give it a shot to earn his full inheritance. 
We cut to Foster wheeling an enormous steel cage with air holes into his building. He warns Tiga to be quiet, to not draw the attention of his landlord, Mr. Zabrowski, who's credited as Mr. Zabrowski. The clanging is loud enough to draw his attention, but the ape shuts up long enough for Foster to convince Zabrowski that the box is full of antiques. They stink! Yeah, well, they're very old. In his room, Foster gets the three cages lined up, but at the end of the row of cages is a set of three suitcases, because Cynthia is moving out. She has no interest in living with the apes. He offers to introduce her to them. Rusty the male comes out first, he's the smallest. Tiga is second and forces a kiss on Foster. And then Poppy comes out and jiggles her jowls for a while, before handing Foster another envelope from Max. The letter explicitly instructs Foster not to read it in front of the apes, but he does it anyway. If I were going to do this, I at least wouldn't read it out loud. Yeah. But it's a movie, and it's also Tony Danza, so maybe he can't help it. The chicken of love has often crawled from the egg of pity. Now you have my babies. Will you take them as I have with generosity, love, and affection? Be advised that if for any reason any of the orangutans should get sick or, God forbid, die, we will forfeit the inheritance, and the entire five million will go to the zoological society. We've promised to house and feed the survivors... Then when they pass on, to stuff them. Poppy. The apes lose their collective shit and start demolishing the apartment when they learn of Max's taxidermy plans. Foster and Cynthia take shelter in the apes' cages and they rip the place to shreds. Cynthia leaves immediately because she's not an idiot. Moments later, there's a knock at the door, but it's Danny DeVito as Laszlo with another message from Max. If you don't close the door in the evening, you can't open it in the morning. Love, Moxa. <laughs> you mentioned it. That's the only one I'm going to mention. I didn't <laughs> write them all down. We cut to the boardroom of the Zoological Society, who it turns out are the bad guys of this film. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought this is where we wanted the apes to end up. Well, we're seeing that their whole boardroom is just filled with stuffed exotic animals. Right. I mean, I think that... In general, they probably do take good care of animals, but in order to get these animals, one of them has to die. Right. But they're talking about how only one of the apes has to die for them to collect the $5 million estate. The room is also decorated with a plethora of taxidermied species. Chairman Gridley complains about their excellent health on account of Sabatini feeding them exclusively organic bananas, but Brandon, the dummy at the end of the table, has another idea. Well, you can always have them, you know, bumped off. <laughs> Brandon, how dare you? How could you suggest such a thing? The walls have ears. <laughs> I love that line. It's just, <laughs> there's so many animals in this room. <laughs> Especially because Brandon follows it by like looking around like, oh, you're right. Another board member translates bluntly for Brandon. What Gridley's saying is don't talk about it. Do it. Do it do it gridley retrieves a stack of cash from a hidden compartment in the head of a boar mounted on the wall and slides it across the table to brandon back at foster's place he's doing tai chi or something in the loft with incense burning when the apes notice him tiga tips a photo of cynthia face down on the end table and unplugs the coffee maker she climbs up the stairs to foster and sneaks up to kiss him while his eyes are closed Poppy steals Foster's newspaper, and Tiga celebrates having unplugged the coffee while Rusty is begging for a walk. Foster tries to talk some sense into them. Suddenly, Rusty falls over with the sniffles, and Foster calls to Laszlo for assistance. We spin transition again to Rusty in a hospital bed that they've somehow brought into this apartment. It's not just his bed. Yeah, yeah, also, is this Tony Danza's apartment, or is this Cynthia's apartment? Uh, this is Tony Danza's oh, is apartment. Oh, it, it's his apartment. Okay. Yeah. Then how how is he affording such a well, nice place? They, they explain it later. Okay. Somewhat. I don't remember that part, but we'll get there. We spin transition again to Rusty in a hospital bed, but still in Foster's apartment under a couple space heaters with a humidifier nearby. A couple. There's like a dozen space heaters, yeah. which I feel like... You're just going to kill this ape. Yeah, it's not how you treat anybody, especially one with a fever. Yeah. Foster takes his temperature and then slips him a couple of pills. Cynthia knocks at the door. Apparently he called her for help and she reminded him that she asked for time alone. 
Foster tries to explain the dire situation he's in. Rusty's temperature is 117 degrees, but we see in the other room that Rusty is poking the thermometer through the grate of a space heater whenever Foster's not in the room. I also don't know what the body temperature of an orangutan is supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, who knows that off the <laughs> top of their head? But she's acting like, oh, you're an idiot. I can't believe you don't know what a chimpanzee's body temperature is supposed to be. Googling also not chimpanzee. Is it not? Orangutan. Orangutan, sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think Are, that, are they all three the same I think, species? I think well, they're they all are, apes. but I, I have a feeling that um, Rusty is a baby. Oh, okay. By the time Cynthia reaches his bedside, Rusty has gotten the thermometer up to 135 degrees, and she wastes no time in calling out Rusty for faking it. Cynthia takes out the chicken soup that Foster ordered for the ape, but Tiga comes over to drink it and replaces it with a beer can for Rusty, who chugs the can immediately. All of this while Foster's not looking, and he comes back and he's like, oh, you ate your soup. Good job. We cut to an Italian restaurant where a trio of offensive stereotypes are enjoying a meal. One of them is Brandon from the Zoological Society, and one of them is Frank Severo, the perpetual mobster actor who plays Frankie Carbone in Goodfellas with the super curly hair and the thick eyebrows. Okay, I looked it up. Slightly lower than the average human body temperature, orangutans are probably around 91 degrees Fahrenheit. So okay. 117 is dead. Yeah, and 135 is dead dead. The other men at the table are mobsters, and they are informing Brandon that they're out of the wet work industry. Brandon says that he can make it worth their while. In the background, we're hearing Nino Rota's Godfather Waltz being played on an accordion to complete the scene. Brandon's first offer is $3,000, and when they refuse, he says, It's a cakewalk. I could do it myself. They invite him to, so he ups the bid to 5000 and they sort of accept on one condition. But you gotta do it with us. You gotta do it with us, I swear. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> Unless we're gonna split the 5 k three ways. If I'm paying you $5,000 to kill an ape, that's supposed to cover the act and all of the liability. I'm not gonna be there with you. And if I am going to be there with you, I'll pay you like a hundred tops because then you're just like my assistance for killing an ape. For some reason, Brandon agrees to the plan though, I guess because we've established that he's an idiot. We see Cynthia and her mother Fiona, played by Jessica Walter, coming out of St. Anne's Hospital and getting into Fiona's Mercedes-Benz convertible. Fiona lectures her daughter on dating an idiot when she announces that she just broke it off. Well, then why is my dolly sketch still hanging in his apartment? Because I forgot it, that's why. And to be honest, I don't really want to go back. I love that line from Walter, though. It's such a fucking Mallory Archer thing to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. After they park and walk toward Foster's apartment, a delivery man recognizes her and asks if she wouldn't mind carrying things up to Foster's place because he's running late. He dumps an enormous fruit basket in Fiona's arms and another large bag in Cynthia's. When they get to Foster's apartment, Laszlo answers the door and is smitten by Fiona. Foster pushes him back into the apartment and steps outside. The conversation here is weird because Cynthia left seemingly for good, but when Foster called her with a soup order, she raced right over with it. Then, just a second ago, she told her mother that she never wanted to come back here, and yet here they are, like both of them yeah. came back to the apartment. And now, Foster is giving them instructions on how to ring the doorbell in the future so as to not upset Tiga. He even tells them which chairs are off limits in the apartment as if they both intend to stay here long term. And it's like, why is the mom here? Why are, you, why are you giving them instructions to visit in the future if you guys are broken up and she's literally just here to collect what she calls a drawing but looks like a painting to me? And Fiona hates him. Yeah. Apparently, Tiga is jealous of Cynthia and she's also staked her claim on a wicker chair on the corner of the apartment. Outside, the mobsters are walking around the city carrying a bunch of paint cans and scaffolding materials. Frank Severo walks behind them and accidentally steps in his own enormous paint bucket and consequently leaves white footsteps throughout the building thwarting their efforts to be inconspicuous or inscapicuous as they pronounce it the secret of this is to act uh, inscapicuous i know that but also nobody ever sees those and it doesn't matter yeah. right they walk around the apartment building rooftop for a while before accidentally clotheslining an antenna again that doesn't matter frank looks over the edge and gets vertigo from the four or five story drop down to a fountain below sometime later the group have assembled an eight-foot section of scaffolding, and we cut inside the building where Tiga is watching Family Feud and clapping along with the audience. For some reason, Cynthia and Fiona are still here too, and Fiona tucks the dolly between the end table and the couch before taking a seat beside it. The mobsters and Brandon start lowering the scaffolding on a set of pulleys as though they're here to paint the side of the building. 
We cut to the apartment of an elderly woman looking out of her window over a flower bed. In Foster's place, Tiga steals Fiona's hat, and she and the orangutan steal it back and forth until Foster advises her to speak firmly with the ape to get results. Firmly. If you so much as touch this hat again, you bow-legged baboon, I'll kick your hairy ass crimson. The ape leaves the hat alone, but when Fiona turns around, it grabs her ass. The lead mobster, Joey, advises Frank and Brandon to fake painting while he spies on the apartment. He's using a telescopic paint roller as a periscope. Inside again, Laszlo is speaking a foreign language to flirt with Fiona as he drops five sugar cubes in a tiny cup of tea for her. I don't know what language he's supposed to be it's speaking. Italian. Whatever it is, it's not a real language. You don't think so? No. Well, I feel like he knows enough Italian to speak gibberish Italian well enough that yeah. I feel like it might be con- might be construed as that. Yeah. It's it's minion-esque the yeah. way he's speaking. On the scaffold, Joey spots Tiga in the wicker chair, but Brandon the moron wants to turn looking through the periscope and won't let Joey take the shot. The elderly woman across the way starts watching the men with binoculars. I love this elderly woman because I feel like if if this were a live action Tweety, Tweety Bird, Bird and Sylvester, yes, hundred yeah. percent. She looks exactly like that old woman, from like the Granny. Cartoon. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes. I thought the exact same thing. <laughs> By the time Brandon wrestles the periscope away, Fiona is sitting in the wicker chair, and he tells Joey that he was just about to kill a human woman, and Fiona vacates the chair for Tiga just in time for Joey to get the periscope back. Joey preps a rifle and the whole dumb joke plays out over again. Fiona and the ape trade places and the scope trades hands. Frank is just trying to paint, so <laughs> he's like painting out the bedroom windows of the apartment. Yeah, he's yeah, he's not even painting the wall. He's just mindlessly painting the glass. The characters are all struggling so much that the beam that they've tied themselves to on the roof starts to bend. The rope for one side of the scaffolding comes loose, and it dumps the men sideways until the old lady freaks out in her apartment. Eventually, all three of them fall down into the fountain below. Hours later, Foster is preparing a fancy dinner when he hears the special ring of the doorbell that he instructed Cynthia to use. He opens the door, and it's her, here again, at the place that she never wanted to come to. This time, he just told her he had a surprise, and she didn't even ask for any more info. That was enough, (laughs) apparently. I mean... She wants to be there. No, I get it, but (laughs) she's pretending she doesn't. The old lady across the way seems touched by the romantic date going on in the apartment. When they finish dinner, Foster starts putting the moves on Cynthia, and she asks what the real surprise is. Presumably she only came here because she was hoping that the surprise was, I'm getting rid of the apes. But it's actually better than that. He wants to offer the executor a million of the $5 million estate to make an adjustment to the will that awards him the remaining $4 million without having to house the apes for another 23 months. She's furious with the plan because she would rather keep the apes for two years or ditch them now and forfeit all the inheritance. I don't I don't understand why she's so upset about this plan. I guess just, well, because she's certainly not afraid of doing something illegal right. like fraud. With yeah, the she's splinters. helping him sell... That's fake true. Splinters to people, the, but it does. But the way she's acting does make it seem like she finds this morally reprehensible. But it's is it more morally reprehensible than than letting Tony Danza kill three apes through malnutrition? <laughs> I don't know. The old lady is disappointed with this turn of events. Poppy comes out to console Foster after she leaves, and in the morning, Foster is making breakfast and makes Poppy try some, which she spits out when he isn't looking. Laszlo comes out and grabs a spoon out of a big bowl of maybe oatmeal and he swings it around as he speaks in a foreign language about his love for Fiona. While he's doing this, he's flinging oatmeal all over the apartment. I think it's oatmeal. I don't know what what this stuff is. Pudding, maybe? Gruel. To punctuate his story, Laszlo starts slapping Foster around and splashing his face with this food muck. Poppy and Foster fight over the radio station on the stereo for a bit. Tiga notices a hair clip on the couch and realizes that Cynthia was here last night. We spin transition to a dojo where Fiona is practicing karate. Mother, I thought you'd be ready. I wanted to practice a few more kids. I'm 50. (laughs) She tells her mom that she's still in love with Foster and she can't help it. Weirdly, the scene ends with her telling her mother that Foster wants her to dye her hair red, which I don't think we ever saw him say, but I'm assuming this is so that when the apes find her hair in the apartment, they won't know that it's not theirs. Oh. Right? That would be yeah, the reason Yeah, I guess that. that makes sense. I yeah. never really understood that line. 
Back in the apartment, Laszlo and Foster are building a jungle gym over the couch for some reason. Foster tells Laszlo that Cynthia is really mad about the hair thing, and Laszlo tells him to buy her something. We cut to them on a date in the Lacma Sculpture Garden, and they pass one of Rodan's shade sculptures, which is the one that looks like Beyonce's single ladies video. But then they also end up in the most ro- romantic place in all of L.A. Right. The Tar Pits. Yeah. Well, it's 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 about a th- three minute walk from those statues to the Tar Pits. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember the last movie that we had that had the Tar Pits in it? The Tar Pits. Sort of. <laughs> oh, uh, Forbidden Zone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Tar Pit Factory. Yeah. That was what it was called. They were making tar pits. While Foster tries to convince Cynthia to move back in, they stage the actors beside statues intended to convey their emotions. Cynthia's is angry and Foster's is depressed. They walk past the elephant statues beside the La Brea tar pits. Usually there's a gate to keep people from getting this close. Yeah. But the production must have gotten special permission. Although... I would have been really worried if I saw Tony Danza like walking around on the set and like in part of it he's walking backwards towards yeah, the tar yeah. pit. It's like stop doing that. Look where <laughs> you're going. You're next to a tar pit. Do you understand what's happening to the elephants in this scene? <laughs> They're coming out of it, right? No. <laughs> this is not how elephants reproduce. It's like a spa day. <laughs> Wrong. You guys would not survive olden <laughs> times. I'll just pull my legs out with my arms and my arms out with my face. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what is that from? The, the Simpsons. Simpsons. <laughs> when Homer's stuck on the tar pits. Yeah. <laughs> Foster thanks Cynthia for how great she's been through this whole ordeal and fishes through his pocket for a gift. At first I thought he was proposing here and I was like, don't do that. It smells like shit out here. <laughs> <laughs> he got her some antique earrings. We wipe to the mobsters and Brandon, now posing as paramedics. Brandon tells them that he just got word that they're running out of time, which yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, that, that's what I was like. Is it, has it been, like, years? No, it has not even been months. They have two years. It has not been two years. I don't care how much time they're implying has passed. There's no way it's been two years. The tiny ape hasn't grown at all, <laughs> un- unless it's, like, a midget ape. And unless, unless there's some kind of implication which was made... That they're that that the will could be contested in some kind of way. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I don't feel like there's any of that, so I don't understand this whole timing. And if if you're going to have it be a timing thing, why set it for two years? Well, because I think to the average person, if they'd set it for two months, it would be like, really, he gets five million dollars for keeping apes alive for two months or two weeks or whatever yeah. the case yeah. may be that a movie could logically take place over. But to have it be two years is just ridiculous. Because well, you can't convey that two years happened in 90 minutes of film. Right, right. But I, I was thinking more in terms of like a Brewster's Millions situation where I think he had one month right, yeah. to, to spend all of this money. Well, there's a lot of Brewster's Millions to this story. Yeah. Um, this clearly inspired some things. It would still be worth it to the Zoological Society to kill this ape on the second to last day of the agreed upon waiting period. So it doesn't make sense that they're like in a rush. It's like, no, we could literally kill it on the last day and you get the $5 million. So just chill out yeah they, they can introduce an element like the zoo, zoological society is like bankrupt right like g- give us some other reason why time is running out yeah in fact the closer they get to the end the more desperate they should be the paramedics line up outside the first door in the hallway it sounds like they intend to enter the next door neighbor's apartment and then break their way into foster's place but as they lean against the door it suddenly opens Inside, the tenant is sitting behind a crystal ball at a table in the corner, of course, fully expecting their arrival. So you've come! How wonderful! Just as he said you would. Welcome! Welcome! She was told by a guide to expect three angels in white and starts reciting the charm of making, which conjures wind and blinking lights in the apartment. But no dragon. <laughs> They get her with formaldehyde and then lay her down on the gurney they brought. Uh, formaldehyde? Not, not chloroform. formaldehyde. Chloroform. <laughs> they kill her. They put her in <laughs> they a embalm jar her and <laughs> preserved her. They ask her if this smells like chloroform <laughs> and lay her down on a gurney they brought. They've also brought huge gas tanks and the new plan is to gas the adjacent apartment and then just fucking explode the monkeys. 
But if they kill all three, I don't think the Zoological Society gets anything. Because according to the will, the money was specifically to provide for the survivors. <laughs> it's a moot point anyway, because they brought nitrous oxide, which is non-flammable gas. Not to be confused with inflammable. <laughs> <laughs> inflammable means flammable? What a country! Nitrous oxide flammable? No, it's no. not. What do, they, what do they put in, in, in Fast and the Furious? Uh, I think that's Nas. Yeah. I googled nitrous oxide. It's not flammable. But isn't that what? But when they put the nos in the car, it goes boom. It burn. If if it were flammable, why would they have two tanks in this scene? That's what I'm trying to ask. No, it is. It's it's not flammable. Okay. Yeah. Googling again. It's non-flammable. Nitrous oxide is non-flammable. Okay. So then the question is, what is nos? Nitrogen dioxide. It's not nitrous, because nitrous oxide is one oxygen. You had a second oxygen, and poof. Yeah. So it's the difference between NO and NO2. Oh, here we go. Uh, well, the compound nitrous oxide is not flammable. It breaks down at 565 degrees Fahrenheit, right. and the oxygen is liberated, and at which point it does burn. Right, but they're not, that, they don't Correct. have any plan of bringing the temperature of this room up to 500 right, right, degrees. Right. Tiga is brushing her hair in the bedroom when a drill bit comes through the wall. She looks into the hole just as Joey looks through from the other side. Somebody looking at me. Oh, I don't know, but they got brown eyes. Without waiting for confirmation that it was an ape, Frank just starts feeding a hose through the wall, even though what Joey just said would imply that they're already caught. Tiga grabs a hold of the hose and just starts sucking gas right out of the <laughs> other end of it. Frank moves around the psychic's apartment taking valuables. He notices that opening a jewelry box operates the curtains in the room, but what he doesn't notice is that it also opens a small drawer right in front of him with a severed human hand inside. The hand rises and grabs him by the collar, freaking him the fuck out. I thought this was hilarious. I don't understand yeah. it, but it yeah. made me laugh. <laughs> I think that that's her like burglary system, that the curtains move specifically to make you look behind you and then when you turn around is when this hand pops up and scares the shit out of you when you run out of her apartment. Whatever's happening in this apartment, I love it. Yeah. I want to live there. <laughs> but it grabs him <laughs> and uh, after a cut, the hand is just a model and Joey knocks it to the floor, annoyed by Frank's distractions. Joey, stop playing around. Give me a hand. Amazingly, he doesn't go pick it up and hand it to him. <laughs> Brandon asks if he's sure nitrous oxide will explode and he says... It was Bad Habit's idea. Bad Habit is apparently the name of Frank Silvero's character, which we learn here. His mother is a dentist, so he stole two big tanks of the stuff. Eventually, there's enough nitrous oxide in the room that all the apes and people in Foster's place are laughing hysterically. Tiga busts out of the locked bedroom by knocking down the door. She's also wearing a necklace that matches Cynthia's new earrings. <laughs> it was a set! <laughs> Yeah, she wanted the earrings too, but I told her it was for you. <laughs> Cynthia goes crazy and starts hurling things from the kitchen at Foster. First a rolling pin, which pings hard off the jungle gym, maybe a foot in front of Tegan. Yeah. yeah. So this is very concerning to me. Yeah. Because the stuff that she's, like, I don't trust my aim. And I, I mean, maybe she's really skilled, but she's throwing real hard objects real close to both apes and and people i think the rolling pin was an accident i don't think she meant to throw it where she did and when it hit that bar the ape even is like what the fuck was that and so then when she reels back to throw a phone she throws like a rotary phone and she throws it like five feet off to the other direction but, because she's like trying desperately but to she be still just chucks it and yeah. and, and mm -hmm. i'm like this is also a very hard object and like there's wild animals in this room like you don't yeah. know where they're coming and going yeah, Tiga could have run over there and just caught it in the head. Laszlo gets home in the middle of the food fight, and Cynthia reels back to throw a blueberry pie at Tiga, who dodges it at the last second, and it explodes in Laszlo's face. I don't know how they did this shot either. I rewound <laughs> it's it a like, real fast pie. I yeah. rewound it like three times, and I'm like, they might have sped up this footage a little bit, but like... It explodes. It's, it's a, And it's a single, single shot action where the ape ducks out of the frame. Yeah. And then the pie flies past into his face, and it's really quick. Yeah. I'm impressed. I think, I think that's all real. All the apes sequester themselves in the bathroom for the remainder of the food fight. An egg is even sent out the window to be splattered on the old lady's window across the way. Laszlo cracks an egg in his mouth, 
and Cynthia splatters the second and also last blueberry pie in Foster's face. The guys next door switch tanks to finish inflating the ape apartment, but this time they hook up an actual flammable tank of gas, which is weird because it's like, this is played like it's a twist, like, oh no, now it's flammable. And it's like, no, that's what they were trying to do before. The joke would have been the reveal of the nitrous tank. Right. Well, and I'm confused because... I'm not sure what the second gas is that the dentist right. happened to have that is flammable. Yeah. <laughs> There's no label as far as what gas this is. Apparently, that's not important. It's just labeled flammable. Though they thought they had two of the same gas, so it's, they're actually lucky that they didn't for what they were trying to do. Tiga starts batting at the hose with a plunger, and back in the next apartment, the psychic is waking up. She stretches her arm and accidentally spins a statue, which kicks the gurney she's laying in, and then she just starts bouncing all over the room, like shouting weird noises and well, it's words. It's like a, like a pinball machine, yeah. which right. is yeah. pinging all the corners. Tiga feeds the flammable gas hose back into the other apartment and clogs the hole with a plunger. Joe flips a lighter open, intending to somehow use it to ignite the gas in the other room, but of course, as soon as he gets a spark, the psychic's apartment explodes. Do you guys remember the last time an idiot murdered a psychic? Uh, Funhouse? Yep. For some reason, Foster calls the Will executor to find out who set off the bomb next door. The guy tells Foster to relax and to go see a movie. Tiga keeps clicking her tongue into the phone before tossing it across the room, and we spin fade to cleaning up the apartment. Amazingly, it's just debris from the food fight, even though the dividing wall to the next apartment should be all over the place. (laughs) Well, and we'll we'll see it in a wider shot later on that there is a big old patched hole right. in the wall. But th- th- this is one of my uh, issues that I have with movies like this where the concept is we're going to blow them up with this gas because that'll surely kill them. But when the bad guys get it reversed and blow... Doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything to them yeah. at all. Like not, I mean, they're not even injured. Right. Mr. Zabrowski leads two policemen into Foster's apartment to reclaim the apes, or so I thought. Apparently, Max has arranged for Mr. Zabrowski to own the building if Foster can keep the apes for the two whole years. I'm guessing then that the five million isn't the whole estate, because even in 81, this building is worth two or three million. Well, and I think that this is like, this is part of the reveal of why he's got such a huge apartment that he could afford. So I assume that this is being subsidized. That his dad just paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. But he never questioned it. Well, yeah, of course He's I like, could get yeah, this place for Most people's months, landlords right? let them pay in splinters of the cross. <laughs> Zabrowski says the cops are here to protect the apes because Zabrowski has a vested interest in Foster making it to the two-year mark. For some reason, Foster is still angry at the end of the scene, even though he doesn't have to keep the apes secret anymore, and he has protection from whoever blew up his neighbor's place. Also, can you just hire cops to protect things? I, I mean, they can. do. Yeah. They do hire somebody to just sit outside his door. But can, but can you do that? I think you can, yeah. If they're off hours, you can pay them to do whatever just they want. Do it, yeah. I know you could hire them. I know that they do get hired for like for gigs. Events but, and stuff. But but usually that's like done through the police department, not done like privately, I feel. Well, the, when, uh, when movie sets use cops or firefighters on set, it's usually people who are either retired mm. or who are off duty. Okay. that are doing stuff on set like as a side job because my dad did that for some stuff. We cut to Cynthia and Fiona fencing. Cynthia complains about Foster buying the ape the same type of jewelry that he bought her and Fiona is amazed to learn that she didn't tell him to shove the earrings up his ass. Boy, are you dumb. No wonder he shares you with an ape. Ultimately, Fiona understands that love is blind and doesn't fault Cynthia for her feelings, even going so far as to offer some advice, but I'm not clear on what Cynthia needs help with. Obviously, she's the one who left Foster, and if she's desperate to have him back, I guess she needs advice transforming him into a less shitty boyfriend, because it's not like he dumped her. If she wants him as a boyfriend, she could just walk in and say, you're my boyfriend. Yeah. She wants him to be better. Step one is apparently return the earring. The first thing we do is give the damn earrings back. Why? Because, dummy, you've got too much pride. I have problems with this fencing scene. (laughs) So... First of all, I mean, I have the same problem with this fencing scene that I have with just about any fencing scene in any movie where they pretend to fence is they make it look like you're swashbuckling, like you're swinging a sword back and forth, like this is how fencing is done, which is totally not how fencing is actually done. My bigger problem is the fact that they're, they're having a match and every time they 
they touch one another with the with the tip it's buzzing which is in fact how it works when you're fencing but the swords have to be plugged in in order to do that and these are not so it wouldn't do that and second of all they're not competition weapons they don't have the button on the end that uh that triggers that noise when they're plugged in and so every time that you know they they do a close up of like touching it and it's like well that just has the regular like it's just a ball ball end yeah. on yeah. it it's not going to make a noise <laughs> Isn't it also an issue that they're not wearing helmets for this whole scene? Yes. As they're stabbing at each other? I mean, I get that you have to see the actors and actresses. I know, and they're supposed to talk to each other and stuff like that, but the fact that they're not wearing masks and they're supposed to be practicing, like, that would never happen. You wouldn't yeah. raise your weapon when somebody's not wearing their mask. I'm surprised they let actors do it, even. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's got silly choreographed moves, so yeah. it's it's probably not really dangerous, but... It's uh, it's still very unrealistic. Fiona sticks Cynthia with her saber. Is it a saber? No, it's a foil. Fiona sticks Cynthia with her foil just as we cut to a man dialing numbers on a touchtone phone and the buzz of the scored point fits both scenes. Someone in a dark room yells into a phone at Gridley from the Zoological Society. Gridley is running out of time to kill one of these apes. The man on the other end of the phone sounds like he's straining his voice a lot and Gridley promises a dead ape on their next attempt. Back at the Italian restaurant, Joey and Bad Habit are apparently not dead or even injured in any way, and they still eat like gross monsters. Like, I don't like listening to these people talk while they're slapping food around their mouths. Joey informs Bad Habit that he looked into the ape situation to see why they even got put on this case, and he's learned the entire deal, and he proposes that they don't need to kill a monkey at all. They can't give you the chip of killing a monkey. That's not it! Do you guys recall the last time we brought up that killing a monkey is a misdemeanor? Any which way but loose? Uh, or that's the sec- That's the first one. Any which way you can? That's not that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a movie where people were trying to convince someone to kill an ape because it's not a felony. I guess it wasn't an ape. It was a monkey. I don't know why I'm blanking. Seems like something I should remember. Die laughing. Uh, She's standing uh, on the side of the boat, and they were like, it's not. It's only a misdemeanor to kill a monkey. <laughs> Joey's plan is to kidnap and ransom one of the apes, since they're worth far more to Foster than they are to Brandon. This time, the mobsters, sans Brandon, are dressed as cops, and they carry a crate to Foster's door. As they pass the psychic's door, I was hoping to see burn marks, or at the very least some police tape, but no, nothing. No decorations to imply that this apartment exploded yesterday. Or a year ago. (laughs) Who knows? (laughs) They sneak up on the real cop sleeping outside Foster's place and knock him out. Joey opens the door a crack and sees blatantly orangutan lips peeking around the corner. Somebody's in there. Who? I don't know. Don't you? It's the fucking ape you came here to take. (laughs) It's the second time that Joey has proven incapable of identifying ape parts, even when he knows that most of the tenants of this apartment are apes. Tiga opens the door and kisses Joey on the lips. They bust into the apartment with their crate, but Foster doesn't hear anything because he's wearing headphones on the couch. I assumed it was night when I saw the cop asleep in the hallway, but apparently it's midday. Joey squares off with Poppy and throws a wild punch way off target. Tiga pretends she got punched and falls over, But when Joey turns to her, Poppy slaps him back to the crate in the center of the room. I also assumed that, like, they had maybe cased the place a little bit. Like, the fact that there was a cop out front, that Foster wasn't home. Like, he set somebody to watch them because he wasn't going to be there. Like, But he's just there. Like, why are you doing this? This seems like a bad plan. And if there's a cop outside, how do you know there's not more cops inside? Right. There were two cops put on this place initially. But apparently they're like the cops in Tuala Goodnight where they're like, I'm going to go to sleep. You go eat dinner somewhere. (laughs) Bad Habit finds a book he likes on the floor and suddenly walks over to ask Poppy what she thought of it. But while Joey recovers from the slap fight, Tiga kicks him out the window and we hear him splash into the same fountain again. Bad Habit didn't see Joey fall, but he successfully slides Poppy and her chair across the room into the crate. When he closes the box, the other side just falls open and the ape walks right out of it. So that all Bad Habit gets away with here is the wicker chair. 
Poppy follows Bad Habit into the hallway, but makes a left and heads for the fire escape when Bad Habit makes a right. Fiona and Cynthia step out of the elevator right as Bad Habit is wheeling the crate in and tells them that he has an axe murderer in the box. What? And why wouldn't you assume that there is an ape in that box? Because yeah. why else would somebody have a crate with holes in it on your floor of this building? So that the axe murderer can breathe. That he's taking out of the building in a box. In Foster's apartment, he can't find Poppy and assumes the unconscious cop in the hallway was in on the kidnapping. He starts to wake up and Fiona knocks him out again with a karate chop. Yeah, it- yeah, because Fiona is like totally on board with this. Oh, the cops are in on it? all I'm, right yeah like I, i'm uh, i'm with and i'm suddenly w- on your side too with yeah. this ape situation they put the unconscious cop in one of the ape cages gridley and brandon from the zoological society show up dressed as fire captains fiona is immediately suspicious the people and apes in the apartment huddle to make a plan the board members put stockings over their faces and bust in waving guns around inside they don't see any apes but by the window, Jessica Walter is fencing with an ape in a full fencing outfit. I think the implication is supposed to be that this looks like Laszlo <laughs> wearing a fencing <laughs> outfit, uh, including a mask this time. So that we can at least tell that it's not an ape head. And that they had masks. Right. As the men search the rest of the apartment, we get a high angle shot to reveal Tiga is actually hiding up on the chandelier in the middle of the room. Brandon thinks he's found one of the apes when he locates an occupied ape cage and sticks his gun through an air hole to shoot what is actually an unconscious cop. (laughs) They decide to take the cage with them, just as the elevator doors close to carry the fake fire captains downstairs with their cop in a cage. The opposite elevator opens to reveal that Laszlo has found Poppy out on the street and is bringing her back. When Laszlo enters the apartment, it seems empty, but when he gets into the bedroom, Fiona and Cynthia attack him with a hockey stick and a fencing helmet. Luckily, they didn't just use the sword. They all leave the apartment together because Foster thinks that the men might return soon. When they shoot that cop, they'll be back. And there may be more of them. <laughs> I love that he's already accepted that they're going to murder an innocent human, <laughs> and it was worth it to keep them from taking an ape. Like, they didn't say, there's a cop in there. Check before you shoot. Yeah. They decide to split up momentarily, but reconvene in like five minutes downstairs. I don't know. Presumably for script reasons. Once they meet back up, the plan is to take all the apes to the hospital where Fiona works. The girls take Rusty and Poppy down in the elevator, intending to circle the block while they wait for Foster, Laszlo, and Tiga. There are so many people trying to steal these apes, it's crazy to think that the safest option is to parade them around the building in broad daylight, but that's the plan right now. Mm -hmm. Foster and Laszlo take Tiga down the stairwell. Suddenly, Jules, the executor of Max's will, steps out of the elevator. He seems to have a sore throat, indicating that he was the man urging the zoological board to seize the monkeys. Foster is only now noticing that Tiga seems to hate Jules when gunmen approach from both sides of the hallway. Foster tells Jules that they might be in some trouble when he pulls out a gun as well. Foster invites Jules to keep the money but leave the apes alone, but at this point Jules seems pretty excited about shooting an ape. Foster punches Jules out and Laszlo tackles Jules' goons to the floor. Luckily, everybody forgets they have guns. The third henchman approaches the fight but Laszlo starts blasting everybody with a fire extinguisher from the hallway. Foster, Laszlo, and Tiga duck into the psychic's completely undamaged apartment, and there she is again, sitting behind the crystal ball, as if she didn't just die in a massive explosion mere days ago. Or a year ago. Or a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other guy survived just fine, so. She never moves or makes a sound, so it's possible that she's supposed to be taxidermied in this scene. She has her hands under the crystal ball on the table, and Laszlo moves over to slide the table out from under them to block the door. They waste a lot of time barricading the door here, and eventually Foster checks out the window and sees the fountain far below. Foster takes the crystal ball from the psychic's hands and wraps it in a curtain. He then swings the ball around before launching it out the window over the nosy woman's flower bed. So now the curtain is strung between the two apartments. The men in the hallway finally think to take a fire axe to the door, just as Laszlo and Tiga begin their journey across the strung-up curtain to the old lady's apartment. Which I thought they were going to do a tightrope. Yes! <laughs> yep. I expected that as well, and I, I have a sneaky suspicion that it was scripted as such. I don't disagree. And they couldn't do it with Tony Danza, or maybe it was Danny DeVito that couldn't do it. I don't know. Yeah, they could have done it with just Tony Danza, then yeah. that would have been fine. Like, yeah. The whole thing of like him having been in the circus yes. but left it now this is his moment to right. 
to yes! be yeah uh, and there's I'm no sure net it, but there's a fountain yeah. under him i'm sure it was scripted as such and they just couldn't do it because there is like i mean i know it's supposed to just be a curtain but there's totally like a slack line yeah. between the buildings and the lady is very amused by this whole scene so she goes to put her teeth in to make a good impression in the psychic's apartment, the curtain breaks loose from the ceiling and begins tearing in the middle. When it separates in two, Foster swings across to the opposite wall. By now, Laszlo and Tiga have already gotten up into the old lady's apartment, and Foster just climbs up into it from the hanging curtain. The bad guys race across to the quote-unquote other building, aka the same building, and they didn't even bother to flop the shot to indicate that it's like the other side. They're like, they come out of the same elevators, but they're just pretending they're on the old lady's side now. Laszlo pushes a laundry cart down the hall in a maid's outfit, and Jules looks right at Danny DeVito's face with a big goatee and somehow doesn't recognize him as his longtime associate Laszlo, assistant to his best friend of many years, Max Sabatini. The goons start firing a gun through the old lady's door when they find it locked, and Laszlo frantically taps the elevator button to escape the floor. I'm assuming the old lady, interested as she has been in other people's business, was listening through the door to hear what yeah. happened and is now lying face down in a rapidly expanding pool of blood. But nope, they move inside and she's standing in the middle of the room with her hands in the air. Meanwhile, Fiona and Cynthia are driving around the block when they pull up alongside a police van. Apparently, along with their policeman costumes, the mobsters went to the trouble of renting an entire police van. Yeah, I don't even know how you get this. Or why. You gotta spend money to make money. This is more than the entire budget that they were originally <laughs> but working But also, I, I just want to point out, they don't know right. how much money they're going to make off of this. They just know that it was worthwhile, at least you know a few grand, for what's his face to have this monkey die right and you're like okay so but do they not know the five million total they don't they, oh, okay i don't think they have any idea because their their whole concept was this this ape is worth something let's right. kidnap him they don't even want to kill him they want to kidnap him and ransom him right joey notices the convertible full of apes hey bad habit yeah I thought you said you got the ape. <laughs> it's a piece of cake. <laughs> piece of cake, huh? Yeah. And who's that? He gestures to a car with the two women and two apes, but they know there were three apes total, so wouldn't they just assume that they have the third one? Or are they better at telling these apes apart than I am? And they're like, no, 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 that's Poppy. That's not <laughs> To Tiga. be fair, the one that's missing is the little one, the baby one. No, the, one that, the oh. one that he thought he put in the box was poppy but poppy came out and the, the only one they don't have is tiga which is another big one they they thought they had one of the big ones and one of the big ones is missing from this car oh okay fiona skids away to escape them laszlo rolls the laundry cart out onto the street and lifts tiga into a truck while foster hops out to steal the vehicle and can so, i just say danny devito's legs are amazing <laughs> yeah he looks great in those he's heels. in high heels in those heels like he's got calves for days i love that he bothered <laughs> with the heels like he could have just worn the dress but he put on the heels yes. too but he's and, running in and them he's running in them on like, sidewalk and this is down a skilled curbs man i yeah. tell you but uh, he throws the ape in the back of the laundry truck and then foster steals it the bad guys start shooting at them and laszlo takes the wheel to get out of here the bad guys hop in their car and back it into a police car before giving chase, and the cops are hot on their tail. Laszlo also starts speaking perf near perfect English in these scenes when he's yelling. Yeah, he's like, "We gotta get out of here. We don't have time for this." Like, like <laughs> I've it, just been faking it this whole time. Well, yeah, I mean, or at least the the, the panic of the situation is, is yeah. allowing him to to be more coherent. Just like the mobsters in the police van, the Zoological Society guys are driving a fire department vehicle with an ape cage stuffed in the trunk. The cop in the cage has awoken and pokes his own gun out of the cage for some reason. Now there are too many cars in the chase and too many groups of people. The mobsters in the police van are firing at Fiona's Mercedes and the executor's goons are following the laundry truck. The real cops continue to follow the executor's car, but then... They turn their sights on the stolen police van firing a gun at an innocent motorist vehicle. The cop in a cage starts shooting the lock off of the cage and climbs around the side to shoot at the fire department car. He fires a shot at an impossible angle that leaves a bullet hole in the center of the windshield. Yeah, magic bullet. Gridley hopes out loud that whoever's shooting at them hits the monkey, as he refers to it. Some zoologist this guy is, by the way. 
Can't tell a monkey from an ape. Brandon sees a gun peeking around their open trunk and announces, Quickly, the guy shooting at us? Yes, it is the monkey. The cops see the executor car shooting at the laundry truck and change course again. All the bad guys, the fire department car, the executor car, and the police van all collide in the same intersection where every car accident has happened so far. And they're dead. Like they are the, for sure, yeah. With the way that car, oh God, yeah. like, takes the roof off of two of the cars and then crashes into the police van. Yeah, they're all dead. Yeah, yep. it just shears the tops off these cars. Yeah, and 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 of course they show a shot of it going through, and that car is clearly empty. Yeah, yeah. the the police van. Yeah, yeah there's then, nobody in the front seat. Yeah, and then you cut back to it a second later, and then they, they put people back in it, but like. It's very empty. And yeah. also, the this accident, if it were a massive fatality accident, would be 100% the police fault mm. because they're the ones who come at this fender bender going 70 on this street and just tear Launch the tops off all the cars. Off, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when it shows Jules and his goon, they're in the, the now convertible car. Yeah, they just like, like sit up like, whew, that was crazy. Yeah, it's just like, what? You're all dead. <laughs> You're ghosts. These are ghosts that are in this car now. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the mobsters got raptured but then they got sent back all of a sudden <laughs> the mercedes and laundry truck pull up to the hospital within view of the pileup, and all the bad guys chase after them on foot as they move the apes through the hospital laszlo continues hitting on cynthia's mother for some reason referring to her as mrs verona even though her name is fiona goodwin like i don't know if danny devito just forgot the character's name or what <laughs> The fake cops follow them into the hydrotherapy room and bump into each other in the doorway before falling into the bubbling pool together while the good guys escape the room. Foster suggests again that they split up, and I'm already mad because the scenes are so much harder to summarize in this script when I have four or five groups of people to follow. The fake cops stumble into one of those Westworld rooms with a bunch of deactivated bodies, (laughs) a.k.a. dead people. Yeah, this is where I... I started to lose focus on what genre this yes. movie was targeted yeah. for. It's real dark. It's yes. like, this isn't a kid's movie. No. There's there's a dead young woman on this slab. Yeah. Some of the bodies are covered, some uncovered, but as they inspect the room closely, we see a pair of distinctly ape-like feet sticking out of one of the blankets. Bad Habit eventually notices. He watches the ape feet for a surprisingly long time considering... For the inserts of moving feet that we can see the ape's face is not covered. Like, <laughs> so it's like, why are you inspecting these feet so closely when you see an ape head on the other end of the body? Well, yeah, and it's moving. Yeah. And also, right. all you're doing is looking for an ape. The second you saw weird feet sticking out from the uh, bottom yeah. of a cart, that's it. That's uh, the ape. <laughs> and, and an opportunity for an amazing joke where the ape has a toe tag and he checks it and goes, oh, not him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Suddenly, another ape swings from the rafters and kicks Bad Habit onto an occupied gurney, sending it rolling across the long room. Two human corpses sit up, Foster and Laszlo, to collect the apes and leave the room. Bad Habit is screaming for Joey's help from the floor because his gurney has crashed and dumped the corpse of a young woman <laughs> yes! on top of him. Oh my and he God. can't lift her off even though she looks like she takes good care of herself. Right up until she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe that there was a body strewn over yeah. him in this scene. It was How shocking. weird would it be to play that person? Like, yeah. I got cast as a corpse, and, and they're going to just drop me <laughs> yeah, on a as a guy's trying to get out. <laughs> God. Fiona and Cynthia are now dressed as nuns with an ape hiding under their robes and warn passing fake policemen to please not run through the halls. Not that I want more people in this scene, but where are the executor's men or the zoological guys? How did only the cops escape the accident? Oh, shit. Here they are. (laughs) The executor's men have guns on the nuns. The fake cops are lured around a corner by Poppy and Tiga. Bad Habit checks in a closet where he's grabbed and injected by something. Like the apes just stab him with a syringe and I would just be like, I would be screaming for a doctor immediately. Yeah. (laughs) Figure out what they just put in me. Yeah. I wouldn't be like, I'm going to catch those apes. The executor's men walk the fake nuns down a fire escape and into the sawmill next door. (laughs) Because this movie wasn't complicated enough. The executor instructs his men to kill everyone in the warehouse and bring him some rope. 
This wouldn't be a sawmill if someone wasn't about to get tied down on a conveyor belt moving toward a circular saw. We all know where this is going. Yeah, he, he tells them to take care of those guys, and they just go and knock out yeah. everybody in they, the sawmill. They, they kill all three guys that were working here. They just walk around, clink, clink, clink. And then they fucking tie the ape to a board on the conveyor belt. Does the ape know this is a movie? The fake cops stumble into the building, and right away, they have guns in their faces. The fake cops try to negotiate a deal, but suddenly attack the executor team as the ape slowly drifts toward this massive saw. This is horrifying. Do you guys remember the last time we had someone tied to a conveyor belt slowly sliding toward their doom? It's like right on the tip of my tongue, but I can't get it. Motel Hell. Ah. Mm, there you go. She was on the conveyor belt, and the, they were having a chainsaw fight with a pig-headed man until they got her off of the belt. Fiona and Cynthia are helpless to intervene and scream for a rescue when suddenly we cut to Laszlo, Foster, and the remaining two apes in the rafters, ready to swing down into the fight like four Tarzans. Foster and Laszlo are still wearing the hospital gowns from when they were posing as corpses earlier. Each of them takes out a bad guy, but the ape is forced to rescue itself by pulling on the lever of the machine as it slides toward the blade. All the bad guys are chained up before the real police arrive to arrest everyone and find the two fake cadavers making out with the two fake nuns. Laszlo has finally won Fiona over, but he has to stand on a pile of sawdust to be tall enough to kiss her. Yeah, and, and it's weird, like, watching, like, people kiss nuns yeah. passionately. <laughs> but also, all the bad guys are being, like, submerged in some kind of, like, bubbling fluid. I'm assuming some kind of staining yeah. material. Yeah, because yeah. they're, like... On, there's like hanging chairs like frames of, of wooden chairs and they're all are, chained up yeah and so they're all like sitting in these chairs like chained up and like being dunked into this material and you're like that's probably that's a lot really of work bad for you also and how how many hours did they spend tying these guys up before the police arrived the apes steal a police car outside and the real cops have to chase it through town as the apes crash it into food carts and parked cars. The credits roll and we hear the film's original song One Way Street with music by Elmer Bernstein and lyrics from writer-director Jeremy Joe Kronzberg and we tilt up to the skyline to end the film. Writer-director Jeremy Joe Kronzberg, like we said, he wrote the first Every Which Way movie and he got a character credit on the second movie. Other than those, his only recognizable credit is as the writer of an original song called Feel So Good to Win from the Coast to Coast soundtrack. <laughs> Music, Elmer Bernstein. He has credits dating back to the early 50s. He scored The Ten Commandments, The Magnificent Seven, Birdman of Alcatraz, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Great Escape, True Grit, The Billy Jack sequels, Meatballs. Last year, he scored Saturn Three and Airplane. This year, he still has Stripes, Heavy Metal, Honky Tonk Freeway, and An American Werewolf in London. I'm blown away that he made time for this movie on top of all that. Later, he scores Ghostbusters, Three Amigos, My Left Foot, Bulletproof, and Wild Wild West. Cinematographer Frank V. Phillips did Herbie Rides Again, The Apple Dumpling Gang, Pete's Dragon, and The Black Hole. All Disney properties. Yep. Uh, last year, he lensed Midnight Madness and Herbie Goes Bananas, so he must be a Disney regular. Editor John W. Wheeler cut Parallax View and The Onion Field. Last year he cut Serial, and then later he will cut Porky's 3, Rocky 4, Space Camp, Ladybugs, and Star Trek First Contact. Tony Danza played Foster here. He plays Tony's a lot. His first TV movie called Fast Lane Blues, he was a Tony. On the series Taxi, he was a Tony. Living Dolls TV episode, Who's the Boss TV series, Hudson Street TV series, the Tony Danza Show TV series, in which he played Tony DeMio, and The Good Cop TV series. He will reteam with Tiga, the orangutan, in Cannonball Run 2 in 1984. He was Duke in Hollywood Nights for us last year. That was his first film. And the last time I saw him was as Jogo's dad in Don John in 2013, which I think Jogo directed, right? Or um, it, That sounds right. But Jessica Walter played Fiona. The late, great Jessica Walter, we just lost her about a month ago. Because of this film, both she and her Play Misty For Me co-star Clint Eastwood have worked with Manus the Orangutan. She was in a 1978 Doctor Strange TV movie as Morgan Le Fay, to connect this back to our previous film. She was the voice of Fran Sinclair on Dinosaurs. 
She has a lot of television work under her belt, but the undisputed champions are Lucille Bluth from Arrested Development and Mallory Archer, mother of the titular spy of the FX animated series Archer. Stacy Nelkin played Cynthia. She was Marlene the cashier in Serial last year and Candy, the lead character's girlfriend in Up the Academy. I believe we've also mentioned that she is thought to be the basis for Mariel Hemingway's character in Manhattan since Nelkin dated Woody Allen as a teenager. She's also Ellie Grimbridge in Halloween 3 and Triola in Yellowbeard. Ah, uh, Yellowbeard. <laughs> we'll get there. Danny DeVito played Laszlo. He's in Batman Returns as the Penguin. He's in Twins, Throw Mama from the Train, Johnny Dangerously. He's Frank Reynolds on Always Sunny, and he wrote, directed, and starred in Matilda, where he played the father. At the time of this film, he was obviously starring on Taxi with Tony Danza, IMDb still lists him in a long-rumored triplets movie, which at one point was going to co-star Arnold DeVito and Eddie Murphy was going to be the third triplet. He also provides the voice of Whiskers, the cat cop in Last Action Hero, Homer Simpson's half-brother Herb Powell, and the Lorax, among many others. And he voiced the Lorax in, like, five different languages. Oh, that's right, yeah. It's insane. He languages he does not he speak. He didn't speak them! That was crazy, because the, the, the studio was like, hey... We can't imagine anybody else doing the Lorax. You want to do the Lorax in like every dub we do. Yeah. And he did it in Russian, like, or... Russian, Italian, uh, German, and Spanish. I think, but two different for he like he he did like Castilian, Castilian Spanish and mm-hmm. Mexican Spanish and like I'm like I, he literally just had people in the booth with him telling him if he did if he pronounced things right and had the intonations uh right, right. and everything correct and i'm like that's just amazing i i assume it would have just sounded like the lorax was an american doing his best you know he had an american accent probably um art matrano played joey he was the gas station attendant from high cost of living who propositioned jane Curtin. he's back as leonardo da vinci in history of the world later this year uh he's also mauser in the police academy movies yeah it, it took me a while to figure out i was like i know this guy from something <laughs> uh and and when i looked up how oh, oh, mauser i don't know why i couldn't remember that rick hurst played brandon he's cletus hogg on the dukes of hazard and he's joe the cop in earth girls are easy howard mann played jules cohen the executor he's the high priest in holy moses last year He's back as a disciple for History of the World Part 1 later this year. His first role was in an awesome movie that Patton Oswalt played at the New Beverly called Blasts of Silence that I really liked. Joseph Mayer played Gridley. He's Dr. Coulson in our first title, Just Tell Me What You Want, and Phoebe Geyer in Those Lips, Those Eyes last year. He's back as the Duke in Under the Rainbow later this year. He's also Bishop O'Hara in Sister Act and the White House decorator in Mars Attacks. Yeah, I recognized him immediately. For some reason, just Sister Act just sticks with me so much that I'm just (laughs) like, I recognize that guy right away. Leon Askin played Zabrowski, who I said is credited as Zabrowski for some reason. He played Parapetchikov in 123. He's back next season as a Moscow anchorman in Airplane 2. Jacqueline Hyde played Zaida. I'm assuming that's the psychic. Right. She was in both Walter Matthau movies last year. She was Lola in Little Miss Marker and a realtor in Hopscotch, presumably the one who rents Matthau Ned Beatty's summer home. Ted White played goon number one. He was a bike cop in Oh God Book 2 last year and Frankie in Demonoid this year. He's Mr. Reed later this year in The Legend of the Lone Ranger and a Roman officer in History of the World Part 1. He also has an uncredited appearance as jason Voorhees in the final chapter which i forget what number that is of the friday the 13th series ellen gerstein played sister she was nurse number one in coast to coast last year and hospital lady with dog in venom the the new venom not the 80s venom poppy lagos played sister i'm assuming these are both nuns Right, Uh, right She was Mrs. Bernardo in The Hunter last year. I think that's the woman who hires someone to get to her son before he dies, and then he dies. Donnie Pontarado played another sister. She was Daphne in Serial last year with Stacey Nelkin. DJ Sullivan was another sister. She was Mrs. Williams in the Attack of the Killer Tomatoes trilogy. Hamilton Mitchell played Marvin. He was Motormouth in Caddyshack last year. He's also Officer Voorhees in Slumber Party Massacre 2. Ruth Gillette played Marianne. 
This was her last movie. That's, I think, the older lady uh, mm. across the way. That makes sense. Uh, she has credits dating back to the early 30s, The Great Zigfield, San Francisco, In Old Chicago, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. She appeared in four episodes of The Facts of Life as Ruth. Henry Charles played the ringmaster. He was the salesman in the shop from Falling in Love Again last year, the place that where his wife worked. Uh, Gene LaBelle played Faraday. Uh, he played Stroke in Battle Creek Brawl. He was Paul in Foolin' Around, Ring Announcer in Raging Bull, and he also had stunt work last year in Bronco Billy, Airplane, Any Which Way You Can, Inside Moves, and that's just from what we've covered. There's oh, He has over 200 stunt credits and 150 acting credits on his IMDb page. Mary Earl played Binocular Lady. Oh, so I was wrong. Yeah, so that has to be the... Uh, she played Malooch in Fatso last year. Oh, That's okay. the one-eyed woman that goes around collecting everyone's lottery numbers. Oh. Gabriel Jarrett played the boy at the funeral. He's credited as Gabriel Kronsberg. This was his first role, and he's also Mitch Taylor in Real Genius yeah. and Rudy in Karate Kid Part 3. You're familiar with Mitch Taylor? Is he oh, like yeah. one of the lead kids? He that, is the main kid. Yeah. He, he is the, the star, really. I mean... That he's taking under his wing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned before, he is the son of writer-director Jeremy Joe Kronsberg. Roger Arroyo played Midget. Uh, he was Cousin It in a couple episodes of the Addams Family series, but he's not the regular performer Felix Silla, who just passed away earlier this month. Sosimo Hernandez played the flugist... I don't know what a flugist is. I don't know what a flugist is either. I googled it and it brought up the credits for this movie. <laughs> he played Uncle Fausto in Underground Aces earlier this year and in On the Nickel, which we got a mini soda on for Patreon this year. Beth Newfer played Elephant Girl. I assume that's the one on the back of the elephant at the funeral. She's a prostitute later this year in Under the Rainbow. She had stunt credits in People Under the Stairs, Poltergeist, The Wrath of Khan, and Big Trouble in Little China. And of course, Manus the Orangutan was the main monkey, which I think means Tiga, because Tiga has the most to do. Uh, Manus was Clyde in Every Which Way But Loose, Poppy on Chips, and Monkey in Cannonball Run 2. Um, oh, and also Monkey on Cheers. So those are all the credits for this one. Um, I asked you guys to bring your three favorite movie apes not ape movies but movie apes the specific oh. ape that was your favorite in a movie oh i didn't uh, know that that was yeah i thought it was the other way around it I was we not were just picking a movie. because 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 then my just pick an ape from that movie but when i when i told you what my movie was planet of the apes yeah you that, that, that that's not an ape choice i just put dr zayas well, that wouldn't have been my choice. <laughs> Who's your choice then? That's what I'm asking you right now. We're recording, Richard. We're not editing it. Who's your ape choice from your top movie? Okay, from Planet of the Apes. If that's your from, top from movie. Ape movies. I'm not picking for you. You have to pick on your <laughs> yeah. own. It's Dr. Zayas. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, I knew it was. All right, Jess. I love you, Dr. Zayas. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. It's the part I was born to play. <laughs> Um. What's your number one? Well, I picked Congo, but I don't know the names of any of the Amy. apes. Amy. <laughs> Amy is the name of the ape in Congo. Come on. Everybody knows this. <laughs> My pick was Moon Watcher from 2001 A Space Odyssey, number one. Uh, that's the one who smashes bones and then throws them in the air. Okay. They had names? <laughs> I don't think any of the other ones do, <laughs> but that one does. Um. Richard, what was your number two? Uh, I'm going with Virgil. Uh, Virgil is one of the apes from uh, Project X. I've never seen that one. With uh, Matthew Broderick, where they're they're basically they're teaching apes to like, uh, like control suicide bombs, nuclear weapons. Okay, and- <laughs> I'm gonna have to watch that one right away then. So we got Day of the Ape instead of Day of the Dolphin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're 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 teaching them how to do that, and so they're trying to expo- see how much radiation they can handle. Oh my god, yeah. that's terrible! All right, Jess, what's your number two? I'm going with King Louis from the Jungle Book. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, my number two is Inga from Phenomena, aka Creepers, played by Tanga the Chimpanzee, who reportedly hated co-star Jennifer Connelly and bit her on set. Oh goodness. <laughs> But there's this, there's a really great, like the end of the movie, uh, Inga plays a very large part in the final scene. I won't yes. spoil it here, but uh, she's phenomenal in that movie. 
Uh, Richard, what was your number three ape? Uh, so this is my my meta one because it's a movie within a movie. Okay. Um, I'm going as, going to pick Suzanne, but not from the movie Jane Silent and Bob Strike Back, but from the Scream sequel that Wes Craven is <laughs> filming with Shannon Doherty removes the mask and it's Suzanne and she goes, An fucking ape? Miramax. <laughs> <laughs> what a, what do they say a number for the installment in there uh i don't remember if they give a number because because they probably eventually made that number if they did yeah i'm sure that they did <laughs> that's funny well because jay and silent bob are in scream four i think are they yeah I, I remember they were in one of them uh but uh or maybe it was scream three they, they were in one of the screams <laughs> yeah uh as a result i think of these the school crossover yeah that because th- those were the same year right where and they had like the when they go to meet with who is it that's on the street where he's like oh miramax accounts for half of my business out here uh it's uh tracy morgan yeah but <laughs> but he was like a monkey wes is like well my research shows that people love animals i fucking love this monkey <laughs> see <laughs> <laughs> all right jess what was your number three monkey or ape i was gonna go I don't think this ape has a name, but it's, and it's just a dude in an ape suit. But perfect. Uh, it's uh, the ape from the Road to Zanzibar. <laughs> okay, that's a good choice. Um, my third one was Elijah from Being John Malkovich, which is like Cameron Diaz's pet ape. Here's some of the movie apes that were suggested by uh, our Twitter listeners. Uh, Rich Bergen said Tannis in Cannibal Run Two just the same ape from this movie spooter dog said clyde from every which way but loose same ape from this movie uh the canon film guide went with bonzo as played by deep roy from the 1987 canon film going bananas <laughs> uh apparently that was supposed to be played by the ape from this movie uh but it like attacked the kid on set early oh, in the Jesus. production and they were like okay never mind we're gonna use a person in a costume and it looks like trash well see and i was gonna go with bonzo from bedtime for bonzo the with Ronald reagan, reagan. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good choice too uh the futurist went with king louis from the jungle book uh presumably the original i think that's what the screenshot was from letters to media went with zira from planet of the apes on discord steven sperling went with gruesome gorilla from warner brothers 1948 bugs bunny short gorilla my dreams <laughs> and samson the gorilla from 1944's nabonga the Brood went with Caesar from Planet of the Apes, the reboot series. Mm-hmm. Ray Hughes went with Conga from the 1961 film of the same name, or Raffles the Chimpanzee from Disney's The Barefoot Executive. That's the ape that's put in charge of programming for a television network. And lastly, we have Mike Lamb, who also went with Moon Watcher. Same, same number one as me from 2001 A Space Odyssey. I, I, ha- I had a, an honorable mention. Um, I wanted to put uh, Scapelli as a chimpanzee oh my god i would have put that that's such a great choice (laughs) oh my god i'm embarrassed i didn't put that when they de-evolve scapelli at the end of super mario oh that's a wonderful choice um yeah this movie's pretty great um it's better than it has any right to be no it actually had a few (laughs) laugh out loud moments i yeah i was thoroughly amused by its ridiculousness i think sometimes i get annoyed though with these ones that get so mad capped that they're like let's make it impossible to keep track of what's going on you only feel that way because you have to take notes of it that's true i watched it and i just plain enjoyed the ridiculousness of it because i don't care which guys are in which room at which moment right that makes sense (laughs) i i feel like when I mentioned earlier that this is a movie that I don't know what genre or who the audience is because it's right. It's too adult for kids, but too kiddie for adults. Right. Cause this, this is not as adult as the any which way you can movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's the same ape doing the same ape shtick. Yeah. But then, you know, so it's like, okay, so this is a movie maybe more towards kids, but then you get into a room full of dead bodies Right. And you have dead body gags. And I was like, I don't see that this is. Who is this for? Yeah. Um, but I feel as a kid, I probably would have really enjoyed this movie. Yeah. Yeah. And it would have been one of those movies that I, re- I looked back and goes, oh, Going Ape. I watch that all the time as a kid. I must, it must really <laughs> still be good. Oh, no. But it's, not, <laughs> it's not great. Um, but yeah, I, I like the performances from everybody. I, it's funny because Jessica Walter is just playing such a Jessica Walter in this yeah. movie. Yeah. Um, 
and the apes are obviously very talented i'm impressed with what they're able to do uh the story doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of the whole two years thing um and all the other people who should be more worried about getting money as inheritance from their you know rich dead father that just drop out of the story in the first scene and then never come back but yeah other than that it's it's enjoyable but it's still a thumbs down for me i would say it's a thumbs up for me i I think it's silly and and like i said better better than it has any right to be yeah Uh, i'm giving it a thumbs down but uh it's it's not reluctant but i feel it's a very weak thumbs down like it it would only take like a couple of little things maybe to just get it to be a weak thumbs up you know what's weird is i feel like this is going to sound wrong for what we're doing here but i think if it was a little worse i would have given it a (laughs) thumbs up the problem is that it's not terrible enough to be funny bad because if you told me without seeing this movie Tony Danza, Jessica Walter, and Danny DeVito are in a movie with three orangutans. I, I would have been sold already. But yeah. then if you told me that it's, I mean, I would assume that it's not good. But when you said it's not bad either, I'd be like, oh, well then, it's probably not, why am I going to waste yeah, my time watching okay. that? I don't know. I enjoyed it. Um, letterboxed, do we know where this is going? Well, I think I have it a lot higher than you guys will at this point. <laughs> probably. you guys gave it a thumbs down. I have it at 17 out of 39 for the year. It's below Atlantic City and above Sphinx. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have it at 27, uh, uh, which puts it below All Night Long, but above Modern Romance. I also have it at 27, which is below Eyes of a Stranger and above another ape movie, Earthbound. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> if that's an ape, I don't know. It's from well, we, another planet and it's green. We did have an ape movie this year. We've had two, right? We've had uh, The Incredible Shrinking Woman had a, yeah. have a, had a pivotal ape in her mm-hmm. escape. <laughs> that is true. Ape escape. And how many circus-themed movies have we had overall? A few. Yeah. I mean, we had, uh, obviously, The Fun House this year. We had... Um, Carney and... Carney, Bronco Billy. Um, good stuff. And the, the, the Jerry Lewis one. Hardly working. Yeah, I was trying to block that one out, but... There it is. There it is. <laughs> brought it back. Right there in my brain. I think that's everything for Going Ape. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We have a Discord now. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at vintagevideopodcast.com slash discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Howling, which IMDb describes like so. After a bizarre and nearly deadly encounter with a serial killer, a television newswoman is sent to a remote mountain resort where residents may not be what they seem. We leave you now with the trailer for The Howling. What do you see? The howling. Somewhere in this city. In this human jungle. It begins. Just try. He's right there. What do you see? What's there, Karen? What do you see, Karen? What's there? Somewhere in these woods. In this primal, sensuous, secret place lies an experience too terrifying for words. And now, all anyone can do is watch and wait. Tonight I'm going to show you something. Make you believe... The Howling.